Right, Joe? One's nodding and the other's going no. Up into on his left and hold back. Off that. Goes down.
país. Oh, thank you. M and E and Knauf. This is a real example. It's a scratchy little drawing, but it's it just shows that, and this caused a major problem. This is about doors and door opening. So the, the door openings themselves had been designed, but the weight of the doors hadn't been included in the details that went for the design of the dry lining. So an extra steel had to be put in. But because the extra steel was then now to provide a structural support, that needed separate fire protection. And fire protection for the this steel doesn't really necessarily dark, mean the same boards on there, drawing, because you're back to test evidence. It put delays on the job. <laughs> And cost on the job, which if it had been designed properly in the first place, wouldn't have happened. Pardon? There is delays there, isn't it? Right. This is what happens in reality. Let's take the abstract into reality. Where what happens when we actually get out on site? This is what happens when we've left site. Job's done, everybody's signed off, building controller happy. I just need to get some extra services from this room to the other room. How do I get services through there? We can do it above the ceiling and it won't be, sh won't be shown. So we're back to how do we put all of this stuff in. If you've got a smartphone, can you get it out now? Because... <laughs> it's great. I didn't... So, what I'd like you to do, have a look at that QR code, and it should work from where you are. It should take you to a website. 
And this is part of a labeling system that, again, we developed with the GPDA, that's the Gypsum Product Development Association, and ASFP, to put on the dry lining above the line of, a, of the ceiling, so that if somebody wants to drop a pipe through later on, it goes, whoa, hang on, stop. Don't do any more. Have you all got to the website? Is that, we haven't made it crash. Ah, yes. Has anybody got on it? Yeah, OK, so some of you are. It's connecting. So what this will do, it will take you to these five points. Stop. Don't do any more until you've thought about it, planned it, check that you can do it, and then record actually what you're going to do. And behind that is a stack of information. Now, I spoke to you earlier on about our penetration guide. What's included in this is further reading. So at the back end of that web page that you've been given, you will get a link to these guides, including the fire stopping guide there as well. There's, that's the purple guide with that image on the front. It's free to download. Please download it. It is the most downloaded guide that uh, we've produced in the last 12 years. Over 10,000 downloads. Huge number. Uh, also guides from ASFP as well on, on fire stopping. So we think that that's sure that at the end of the day, people are, are able to do something. The elephant in the room. There's always an elephant in the room, isn't there? There's the stuff that we don't want to talk about, stuff that we think we know, but actually, where are the issues? Now, Jeff and I had a, a long discussion this morning around where are the issues? Where are the real issues? Are we doing everything that we can do? Was it reasonable? There we go. Are we doing everything that we should be doing? So where is the elephant in the room? This is one of them. And this actually is one of the things that I had a chat with Ian about this morning. So taking one system, that's the structural system, and the other system, which is the dry lining, how do we make those two things actually integrate together? Quite often we end up using the uh, structural elements as our grid lines, and the grid lines become the compartments. But what happens when you fit a dry lining to the underside of a beam and the beam has got a reactive coating called an intumescent paint? Because if you fix something to the underside of it, you stop the reactive coating from swelling and protecting the steel. So, should you do something like this? Because if you've got a compartment line, it's also got to deal with the acoustics between one space and another. It's got to deal with the thermal transfer from, from one face to another. This is one of the suggestions and one of the details. But what about the deflection? How do you deal with the deflection on the space as well? All of that's got to be coordinated. OK, so let's have a look at something that is working. Doors are working. I think the, the, the time when somebody would go, I buy a door from them, I get a frame from them, I get ironmongery from them, and, uh, unless you guys tell me differently. We're now into door sets. We're looking for something where there is test evidence for all of that together. So that test evidence comprises of all of these things. It is the frame. It is the ironmongery. It is the right intumescent tested in the right supporting structure. All of that has to come together as well. So we're used to terming things with fire. If I said a fire door, yep, I know what you mean. Talk about fire curtain, fire stopping. We know exactly what we mean. Fire damp, fire glass, we know exactly what we mean. What about the wall? We don't tend to use the term firewall. And it's something I'm on a mission to. Because what happens when you do the drawing for the petitioning, it's got internal wall type, internal wall system, IWS, IWT, bump, 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 bump. Then you might get another drawing with the fire strategy on it, actually showing where the compartmentation is. Why don't we really clear on where the firewalls are. Let's start talk, calling them what they are, which is firewalls. So what about the anatomy of a firewall? What happens? Where, where's, where are the things where you need that interaction, that interface? Doors are an obvious one. There's a, there's a drawing there on the, on, on the side which shows two types of openings. So if you understand dry lining, you'll know that one is a lined opening and one is an unlined opening. So you need test evidence for both. 
What if it's a non-symmetrical partition, a shaft wall? You've got evidence of that door set in that shaft wall, in that being in, in installed in that way. Riser doors are a, a classic example of that access door. They need to be tested in the right supporting structure, tested in the right way. Then we've got all of the services that are running through it. So some of them are high-level penetration. We've also got service drops. We've got them here, we've got them here. We've always got services, we've got partial penetrations which are in there as well. They need to be covered too. And then you've got all of the abutment details. And how do we deal with all of those abutments? What happens when we put a patris in a drywall and we've still got the fire racing? Because we're going to hang something in the face of it. Is that right? We've got evidence for that? Do we just assume? Do we assume that that will do that, will do that, will do that, will do that? So, Mandeep said to me earlier on, we need a call to action at the end of this, please. We need to do, what are we going to do about stuff? It's all very well saying here's the problem, but what are we going to do about it? We started to list, you know, all of those test standards that, that I put up at the beginning. How do those test standards relate then to all of the things that perforate the wall? And are there, in fact, standards for some of the things that we want to do? Or are there missing standards? And what can we do about that? Government listens to industry through the trade bodies. So for our sector, so for our sector FIS represents the fit-out contractors. In terms of the manufacturers, they're represented by the, Con the uh, Construction Products Association. Peter Capelhorn's their chair, and their offices are actually here. For the contractors, Build UK represent the, the contractors. So Build UK and CPA, they're the two people that have the seat at government. So in turn, we get to talk to government through that. If there's gaps in here, we need to start pushing to have those gaps filled. That's our call to action. That's one of the ways that you can get involved through your contacts here at CELO, and we, we can start to work with you at the moment. If you can, again, put your hands up if you work with dry lining, if you're familiar with dry lining. OK, not so a few of you. OK. So one of the things about dry lining, which we've seen since Grenfell, is caveated information. Seeing it all the time. It's frustrating, isn't it? Thank you. It's all their fault. Why do you think they caveat the information? They're not being obstinate, they're not being awkward, but they're actually making it really clear of what they can and cannot do. So, for example, you will see caveated information for junctions and corners because there's no test. How can they test something that there is no test for? So they have to caveat it, and that decision then has to be made by the, by the designer. How can, they, how can they actually say that, this drawing will work in this job because the only test that we've got is a three meter by three meter opening. So you want to build it, but we're building to the underside of a, this type of beam or this type of structure or this type of superstructure or this type of mullion. They don't know all of that information for every job. It's up to the designers to be able to understand what's required and how that works together. So that's why you see caveated. They're not being awkward, they're really nice people. Honestly, they really are really nice people. So the question always is, who's the designer? And I would suggest to you, when you're in your contracts meetings, when they start to talk to you about contractors' design portion, who's the designer on the job? Building Safety Act will change that. There will be a principal designer appointed on every job. And this, in terms of where does it apply? It will apply on high-risk buildings, 18 metres plus, where you've got at least two residents. You might be working in a shop in Regent Street with flats above it. That'll be an HLB. It will affect more than we think we know. And this will be good practice. We'll see this watch all the way through so that we have competent people that we can point to. So if you look at CDM, it's very clear about who the designer is. There is also a risk of the unintended designer. So I was involved in contracting. First thing that I would do is somebody said, we're going we're gonna to do this. In my head, I'm starting to build it. The detail. And why? Because I want to be helpful. If I'm helpful and we get it agreed, we can move on. I want to be able to show my expertise as well. 
I can become the unintended designer. I don't carry PI. So be aware when you're giving advice, unless you're carrying the PI, don't become the unintended designer. This is what architects work to. The RIBA planner works. It's really good. It's a good structure. A lot of people actually don't understand all of this and the various stages that they go through. There is a point at which you have a descriptive specification, which then gets turned into a prescriptive specification. That's the point at which the detail should come together. This is the blurring point between stage four and stage five, where we build and design rather than build. We're seeing it all the time. Conversations I've had today just re-emphasize that, that that can happen. Be aware that that's something that can happen. This is the, the old thing, Building Safety Act, profound change. There are profound changes to the way that we work. These gateways will be the stop. Conversations I've had with Tier 1, the concern that they have is that the developers, the people that are employing them, don't understand this and the time it takes to go between those two. So if you go for Stage 2, you haven't got all the information, you get a stop doesn't mean you can start on site and sort it out, which is sort of the way that we do things now. It's stop is stop. That process to start again can take four weeks. There will be a lot of stops. There will be a lot of delays. There will be a lot of people going, how come? And that's going to change the thinking. And thinking and culture change is one of the big things that will drive this, drive the change that we've got. This is the secondary legislation that we've through. Um, this is Michael Gove, I'm not going to talk about him. Um, this, if anybody watched the Grenfell Inquiry, who wanted to be in the chair? Who wanted to be that person who said, what did you do? Where's the evidence of what you've done? Have you done everything that is reasonable and practical? We don't want to be those people. We don't want to be there anymore with, with doing that. And you can do that by following a very simple process. We call it PPP. Product, process and people. Product, make sure that the products that you've got, you've got evidence of compliance with that system, with that system before you start. Process, record all of that. Now, one of the big issues with dry lining is the stud, isn't it? Board, isn't it? Isn't it? Where is the evidence of that stud with that board, with that screw, with that filling? Don't assume that every board is the same, every stud is the same, because they're not. Manufactured by different people, their mix is all, all slightly different, and they perform slightly differently. So record all of that information. The last bit is about the competence of the people themselves. So at the moment, we've got CSCS cards. So one of the things, and I don't know how far it's got with the conversation about my professional passport, Harry, and whether we can provide everybody with a, a certificate. But how do you, so when you sit in something like this as part of your continual professional development, how do you record it? How does it sit? How does that show for your future competence? So my professional passport is something that is out in the domain now, where you'll be able to put all of your learnings and experience in one place. That will become your passport to going forward. There is a point where your competence will be checked using the Building Safety Act and they will be asking for it and they'll be asking for it and it's not just the competence, can you screw that to that, can you fix that to that? Because so much about the competency has been about the installers. What about the people marketing it? What about the people selling it, specifying it? What about the person who's buying it? Do they understand that they have the fire stopping? Do they understand what they're buying? And the supervisors, and the installers, and the people who are main maintaining it. So that level of competence, government call it SCEB, which is skills, knowledge, experience, and behaviours. We came up with SAKE, excuse me, rather than behaviours, attitude. They stuck with SCEB, so SCEB is what it is. There is a PAS. Um, Number's gone out of my head. But there is a PAS now which is being used and a series of British standards, um, sorry, FLEX, 
Do you remember the number, Ian? No. So flex is the overarching standard, um, and then there are two passes, a pass for a, the principal designer and the principal contractor. That will wash down, and there will be another se series of, of competence registers. So that's going to that's be the big change. This is the stuff that we talked about. Only about 6% of jobs start with everything. That results in about 17% waste. If we waste 17% of plasterboard because we haven't got the information, it's possible to lose another 10% in handling, leaving stuff out in the rain, getting corners knocked off. It's possible to lose another 20% systems waste, they call it, so where you've got to cut out for doors so that you can... You add all of those items up, that's an awful lot of percentage of waste. 17% just because we don't get all of the information right now. There's a lot to do. UKCA marking, probably not for now. I'm going to move on from it. This is a brilliant quote. Wish I, I said it, but it, Andy Webster said it about 10 years ago, and I've always used it. No one is going to change until the risk of staying the same is greater than changing. We are at that point. We carry on good enough. That'll be all right, won't it? We're past that point now. We've moved on from into other stuff. This is another little quote that I wanted to finish with as well. Um, anybody recognize this chap? Scully? He was the chap that flew off from one of the airports in New York. They hit a bird strike and he went, what am I going to do? If anybody's got a two pound coin in, in their pocket, if you take it out and look around the side, there's an inscription. And the inscription says, standing on the shoulders of giants. Basically, he's saying the same thing. I could land that plane because of all of the other disasters that took place earlier on. And we've had a huge learning five years ago. This is that point where we can. So. I think we're doing questions later, are we, or now? Sorry. No, I've never finished, no, no. Harry. You may have gathered. <laughs> no, we gathered that. But I just had a couple of um, quick ones. Yeah. Um, tell us if you could quick comment about the lack of evidence. Yeah. There, so the three things. So Dame, Dame Judith started all of this off. She wrote two reports. The first report she wrote in the November following the, the, the fire, and she said there is a lack of evidence, um, lack of recording of what we do. So we've got no idea what we've built, how we've built it, where it is. She said there's a lack of evidence that what we're building is compliant. So we don't know. We're putting stuff together and we don't know whether it will work. And the third bit was there is a lack of confidence in the market. So one of the things that went wrong at Grenfell, and I, I had this as a real example yesterday, there is a big difference between, we just talk about fire rated. There is resistance to fire, its ability to hold back a fire or hold back the heat. But the other is what we call reaction to fire. So reaction to fire, we had a class O, haven't we? Class O, class zero, they called it. There's no such, there's no such thing. There's no test for class O. You did a test and you got a class one. You had another test with class one. You put those two things together. You got what industry called class O. It was a reaction to fire. It was about a surface spread of flame. The people who picked up some of the insulation to use around the windows where the fire broke out, said it's fire rated. There's fire on it. That was a lack of competence and understanding of what they were doing. Burnt, burnt away inside. So we need to address all three. So the Building Safety Act is built on that. So you will hear things about the, uh, the golden thread. Where's that golden thread of evidence? And that golden thread of evidence not only has to be in a digital format, but it needs to include all of the test evidence. Now we hear that time. Have you got a certificate for that? Can I have a certificate? There are certificates for third-party tested products. Generally, what they're looking for is a test report. You need to see the test report. You need to understand 
what was tested, what the results are, and whether you're building against that test report. And the other thing is about competency, which is the thing that I finished off of, being able to, having that skill, demonstrate your skills, knowledge, to show that you are competent. CCPI is a, is a really good thing. I re, I'm glad you raised that. So there, was, there were 12 working groups set up to look at competency. Working group 13 was looking at the marketing of products. Uh, two, two words that really get me animated. One is soundproof, and the other is fireproof. Soundproof, fireproof, no proof. There are no such things as either of those things. So... When it comes to marketing, if somebody has in their marketing information, this is soundproof or fireproof, clearly the marketing goes beyond the performance of the product. So the CCPI, which is the Code for Construction Product Information, is a 12, no, 11 clauses, basically says all of the information that you use in marketing, it should be able to be substantiated, the information should be clearly available, the people who are pulling all of that together should be competent to do that. So the CCPI, you will start to see probably from about this time next year, maybe earlier, code compliance. The code compliance comes through from various manufacturers, and that's a mark of, of quality being a job. So industry is listening. People are saying nothing's happened since Grenfell. Things are happening. It's taking a long time. We're back to that culture change, but it is. Um, I should have mentioned. We have a very short five minute break now. I have a presentation from Jeff and Tom and Mandy. After that, we'll have a 10 minute break. Then we'll go into a panel discussion. And I'm really keen for all of you to make notes on questions that you'd like to ask. Please push back if you um, think it's necessary. No tomatoes are allowed to be thrown. But any, anything that but I've got, a, for instance, for architects out there. What do you think from Joe's comments that such a low percentage of projects have is that what, what needs to happen for that to be able to provide that? Is that realistic? If not why not? And for contractors, what um, Joe was saying about to understand fire test reports and so on, what's, um, I'd, I'd like to hear from you in relation to you're dealing with so many products at the time. Is it realistic to test reports? Or um, is it really for us as manufacturers to work with you to provide that information in relation to build of applications and so on? So please um, make a note of any question you've got. Um, we'll take a quick five minute break now if anyone needs to use the toilet or grab a drink. Set up for the station. Thank you.
Is it on? Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, morning, all. Um, I think going after Joe is quite a, quite a, a difficult uh, read to, to do his uh, my level best. But um, yeah, so Joe's given a, a, an overview from an industry perspective. And our presentation from Canal, also in line with the gypsum based uh, material suppliers, we're going to look at it from a, a manufacturer view viewpoint. What do we need to do to bring product and system to market? So just to give you a theme of what we're going to look to cover, both me and Ian, we're going to look to understand what are the required building performances that dry lining system providers need to follow. I or we, 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 we look at four fundamentals, and that will be uh, discussed shortly. And then what we're going to do, we're going to go into more of a focus area. What do we do as a manufacturer? How do we bring product and systems to the marketplace? And what are the challenges that we face? Aligned to the doorways and door openings, we'll look into what are the key performance requirements that we need to consider. We'll discuss about that. There is a challenge. It's the, the challenge is the variations. The variations on site that occurs. How many doors, the sizes of the doors, where they are within our petition systems. So we'll discuss that as well. Finally, aligned to what Joe said earlier, how do we provide guidance for good practice? How do we work collaboratively together to ensure that the right guidance and information is given? Because as we know, as a dry lining system provider, we know what we can do. As a door manufacturer, they know what they can do. How do we all work together? I put this slide up. I think it's more me rather than we. Manufacturer viewpoint. In my, my uh, experience, 20 years working as a manufacturer, the manufacturer knows everything. Go to them. They know the answer. If you're on site, you have an issue, go to them. They will have the answer. Yes, we do, to some degree. But actually, we have to work collaboratively with the supply chain, the main contractors, subcontractors, to ensure that we are, whilst a part of a jigsaw, um, we, we, we're only one part. So building performance is something that we would look into as a system provider for dry lining. You have heat loss, energy use, water use, water tightness, structural performance, fire performance, acoustic performance. These are generalized, um, what we call physical attributes in terms of building performance. For us, we need to understand our market. And there are various di di different building types out there. There are commercial buildings. There are hospitals. There are schools, and there are, well, actually, the last one's missing there, at residential. Now, all of them will have different levels of performance because of the usage of the building and the shape of the building and the size of the building. They all have different requirements. So for us as a manufacturer, we need to understand what those requirements are. But it's very important for us as a manufacturer to understand regu regulations and legislations available out there. So you can see there, as an image, um, the, the, the building regulation for England. There are many uh, approved documents within there which we would need to follow. It's also important to know that if you look at the UK, each national has its own set of regulations and standards. So it's very important that wherever your project is based, you understand those standards. It can be easily um, confusing when you're speaking with someone on the phone understand where you can offer a helpful device, it's very important to understand the location to ensure that you're giving the right guidance. And for us as a manufacturer, we need to uh, bring our expertise um, out there. And this is what we, 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 we tend to do. Okay, so when dealing with wall systems in particular, we look at four fundamental areas. There are many more, but we will look at four. One is what we call, when you're designing a partition system, a drywall partition system, as you can see around you, we have to consider strength and robustness. So the strength being how strong the system is to ensure its serviceability, so it doesn't fail or collapse. The robustness, meaning if you were to actually um, hit the wall or kick the wall, making sure that the plasterboard doesn't rupture to significantly causing, causing issue. 
And the other one is their stiffness. This is what we call deflection. So this is basically a petition. How much can it deflect by um, to allow it still to be compliant? An example is when you put tiles onto the wall, you know that tiles are fairly brittle. You'd want the wall to be less, uh, well, more stiffer than, than, than when it's without. So that, this is something that we <laughs> consider when we design our, 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 our systems. Topic of the day, fire resisting. We need to ensure, in line with the regulations and legislations out there, what levels of performance do we need to meet? Is it a 30 minute fire resistance wall? Is it a 60 minute fire resistance wall? Is it a 90 minute fire resistance wall? Or is it 120 minutes fire resistance wall? They're, they're all uh, requirements that we need to follow. And they need to obviously meet the required um, building type, whether it's a school, hospital, um, a residential, also depending on the heights of the building, a tower block, so they all vary. So we need to ensure we are offering uh, the required levels of systems to meet those requirements. Acoustic sound reduction, just quickly touching on this. Petitions, sound absorbing, sound reduction. We would design our systems in accordance with, again, the regulations and legislations out there. Less so on thermal, but it's becoming more and more. Walls, in, in particular petitions, they're being required to um, offer more thermal efficiency. So you might be seeing now more insulation being used in walls, in particular party walls. So this is something happening, and there is a change in regulations that have um, I think it's part L that's come out now, which uh, is more of an enhanced level of performance for thermal U-value requ um, requirements. Okay, so just coming back to today, really, and in lining with, in particular, doors within petitions. What is our focus area that we're going to be looking into? And with that, we need to ensure in particular petition systems, that we're following the regulations, compliance that's available, and guidelines to ensure that we're offering the right system to meet um, uh, uh, out there. The man manufacturer, okay. We're a manufacturer. We're not, we're not there on site designing and building. We're a manufacturer of products and systems. This is our expertise. This is a picture of one of the factories up, uh, up north in Immingham, but also the gypsum other uh, based providers will have their own factories as well. I'll try to create a bit of a, a stage process here just to explain you how we get product into marketplace. The first aspect is product and manufacturing standards. So each product that we supply has its own manufacturing standard. So in plasterables, we refer to what we call the standard called EN 520, and within that standard, it tells about how to make this uh, gypsum-based plasterboard to be um, com um, compliant in terms of strength, uh, stiffness, bending, and, and tolerances that, that, that needs to be followed. So this is what we follow there. This also includes metal as well, metal studs. It also includes screws jointing materials, tapes, they all have their own product and manufacturing standard. So we need to ensure each of those products are aligning with the um, um, harmonised manufacturing standard. This is at the point also where you are able to UKCA mark your product or CE mark your product. If you tick that box, you've got a fully compliant product to be sold. As I mentioned earlier, one of the strongest points for us is to understand the marketplace in terms of technical uh, legislation and regulations. We need to understand, when we're designing our systems, what level of performance we need to be achieving. So in, in terms of fire, as I mentioned earlier, does it need to be a 60-minute wall, 90-minute wall? Where do you use these walls within a specific uh, a building type? Well, OK, well, let's assume we now know that we need a 60-minute wall. How do we test? Well, we need to have a test standard. We need to refer to a document that allows us to test. We can't make it up ourselves. There is a test standard 
available, and, this, and that's what we would follow. Okay, so we follow that test standard, and then we have to carry out the test. And the test is, if I, if, um, and I will show you shortly, in particular fire test, you would need to build in accordance with the methodology that the test standard says. Okay, so now we have that test report, which gives a level of performance. We need to then understand how do we get that product or system into the marketplace. So there's a lot of work that happens uh, between that stage and, and, and the last stage to, to get that product and system to market. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a, an overview of what we have to do from a manufacturer's uh, uh, point of view. So aligning to today's uh, session, I would say these two are probably the key ones uh, that we would need to consider, especially the impact of doors within petitions. One is fire resistance, and the other is uh, structural stability. So both me and Ian will be looking to cover this, and we'll do, um, discuss both of these two, two points here. So coming on to fire, we would, as I mentioned, refer to the fire test standard, which is, if you look on the left-hand side, it's, a, it's a, a BSI document that tells you um, how to um, test uh, fire resistance, in this particular case, non-load-bearing wall systems. In the middle, you would then test in accordance with that test standard and build it in accordance with that test standard, which will then allow you to then get a finalised report on how the system achieve, um, performance achieved, how the system actually uh, performed. And once we know that, test standards, there is no pass or fail criteria with test standards, by the way. There is no, there's no such thing. It's whatever, <laughs> however the system performs, that's the result. And I think that's key to notice. So when you see fire test reports, you might see something that gives 70 minutes, 92 minutes, 93 minutes. That's the test output, that's not a pass or fail criteria. So I think that's very important to realise. Then what we would normally do there is we'd have to get what we call a fire classification report. A fire classification report then summarises where it's, if a system did achieve, for example, 92 minutes, that now disclosed that system achieved 90 minutes. If it's a 72-minute system, it will then uh, meet 60 minutes requirements. I think this is very important to realise. And what I advise you here, when you're working out there and you need test evidence, speak to the manufacturer. That's what we need to be doing. I'm just going to quickly show you um, a fire resistance test. This is a, a front cover of one of our test reports. In particular, non-low bearing petitions, the systems which are infilled in between structural, stru structural frames, um, on the left there, you can see a vertical section, a cross section of, of, of our petition with the, the flame on one side. And on the top there, you see the, uh, a plan view. We, within the furnace, the, 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 the test is carried out. There are two fundamental um, uh, outputs in terms of non low bearing systems, in terms of performance. One is integrity and one is insulation, okay? Integrity is about the ability of flame to be resisted from one side of the wall to the other. That's what integrity is. Insulation is the ability to restrict the temperature rise on the unexposed side. So basically, if there was a fire on one side and you're on the other side and you touched the, the surface, there's got to be a mean temperature um, before it starts to cause what we call just to cause ignition on, on, on the other side. This is what we would normally do in our fire test. And this is for non-low-bearing walls. If it's a low-bearing wall, you would have another criteria to be covered called R, which is uh, low-bearing as, um, as, as well. The important aspect here is petitions in particular is integrity and insulation. So when you look at doors, if, and when we discuss later by, by Jeff and, and Tom, understand the integrity and insulation. These are two Two key points to, to uh, keep in mind. Just uh, a couple of photos there. Um, 
The left-hand side shows, um, similar to the, uh, the image uh, uh, Joe show, showed earlier, this is a petition fire test at zero, zero minutes, just about started. And you can see there on the right-hand side, the system achieved 40 minutes. Uh, you can see uh, one of the vertical joints, you can see the flame coming through. So the test was stopped. The interesting point here is we've, we've, we've achieved a, a performance, 40 minutes. This was for a system that we promote into the market for 30 minutes compliance. And this is a system that we, we have, and this is where we go to market. The interesting thing to, um, uh, to know here, especially if you want to look into the detail of, of petitions and, the, and, and what happens in a fire, the petition starts to flex, it starts to bend. And this is very important when we, we just look later on with Silo's presentation in terms of, well, what's the impact when you put a door in it? What happens to the, the, the shape of the petition in line with the door itself? This is, this is important to, to, to keep, keep in mind. So I'm going to pass you over to Ian, who's going to cover um, uh, aspects on, on stability. Um, I, I put, this, put this slide here, is, and just to re reinforce Joe's uh, slides earlier, it's very important, if you don't know, speak to the manufacturer of the drywall system, or system owner. System owner, in this case, as Joe mentioned, is who owns that particular system, who's tested that particular system, who owns the, the copyright of that system. Speak to them for test evidence. If you can get the evidence, great. If it's different, still speak to them. It's very important you pick, uh, um, speak, to, speak to the manufacturers because they will be the ones that will be testing their products in line with the test standards available. OK, so what next? Doors. Ian?
also now include a range of headers to deal with different openings. So that's available as well. Okay. So once you've got the information, um, obviously then it goes into a specification and it goes live onto a project. So um, Mandeep's little play on words here to reveal or not to reveal. So in the test, we don't actually line the jams with plasterboard. We take the door frame and we fit it into the rig. Now, clearly, as I said earlier, that they, we test in the worst case scenario, which is a single board on a 70 mil stud. So we leave the jam uncloaked. You see in a C stud in the first image with a door frame. However, we're moving towards recommending now in all our specifications that the door jams are lined. Because if you take a 146 stud, put two layers of plasterboard, you end up at 208. And then someone comes and puts a slim door in it, you've got exposed metal to deal with. We're actually leaving the option there for the designer to say we want the door either cloaked or not cloaked. So we're covered and make sure that we're doing the right thing, that the system performance is maintained for fire and acoustics. When it comes to a, a twin stud arrangement, again, you've got two studs. Um, it's important that the cavity is closed off from a performance point of view. So you'll see two layers of plasterboard. And it's not un unusual for the, for the door position to be either central at the face or at the back of the, uh, of the, of the opening. But bear in mind that twin frame arrangement will be uh, possibly 210 or 250 250 mil wide. In addition to this is also things like secure by design that we have to consider where we're putting in a provision possibly to stop breaking through, through door openings. So there's a whole host of things that are going on around door openings. Um, again, it's important that you talk to the manufacturer to make sure you've got the correct detail for the correct opening. Mandy, you can pick this pill. Yeah, can do that. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Uh, just uh, a couple of sw slides on comparison of rigid against flexible. I think it's quite self-explanatory, but if you have a rigid construction, like a blockwork wall, and you put a door frame in it and a door, the likelihood of, 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 of bowing happening on a, on a rigid construction is going to be far less than if it's in a flexible partition system. I think that's quite, quite um, e easy to understand. Um, the key point here, and, and it's, it's also going to be discussed later, the variations of partitions in particular of flexible walls, because you get different sizes of, from maybe a 50 mil stud frame to a 70 mil stud frame to a 146 mil stud frame, along with the variations of it of being a single layer board or a double layer board or a three layer board system. So what I'm trying to get to is stiffness of the partition in comparison to um, uh, the, with the door in it can vary depending. Everything has its own entity in terms of level of performance. This is within the stand of 1364 part one. Just got a few images there, which I'm sure our colleagues at CELO will explain a bit further on. But in essence, what you see there, um, you see a comparison of a timber leaf, timber frame, uh, with, with a furnace along with a timber leaf and a metal frame with a furnace along with a metal frame and a metal frame within the furnace. In essence, what you can see, the deflection of the, the system under fire varies. Some bow inwards, some bow outwards. And, and it's very important to, to understand that in, in, in terms of what construction you're, uh, you're working to in, in that respect. We have some challenges, and Ian, we're going to come carry on to this. We're, and the challenges now is really to do with, we now offer these products and systems into the marketplace. That's what we do. We put them onto site, and guess what? Everything is non-standard. What do we do? Uh, yeah, variations on projects. It'd be great if all things were standard, but they're not. We live in the real world, and things change. Um, clearly, we, we like to try and reinforce the message uh, about the, the size of doors, the test evidence. But actually, when we get onto site, there's plenty of variations. 
So this is something which we commonly come up against where a door is built and somebody wants to put a service through it. A series of ducts um, and a service zone needs to be created. So straight away here we're moving away from the tested procedure of uh, slamming the door which is set out in BS5234 and we need to do something different. It's not a tested arrangement but there's a way of building it to ensure that the frame's stiff, fixings can be achieved and basically the system of the plasterboard and metal is fixed properly and then obviously collaborate with the door people to make sure that that's fixed correctly as well. That's something we encounter day in day out. The other thing, and again these, these, both these details are from live schemes we've been involved in where both jams have been cut through. So that's a very unfortunate situation. However, it happens on schemes, so we've got to adapt to make sure that the system can be built, the fixings are maintained, and the system secured properly. So here, the, the header is reinforced and the jams are reinforced. So we're staying as close as we possibly can to the tested arrangement. Uh, we're just going to go into some photos here of what we actually do find on site. Um, again, this is a cross corridor wall in an apartment scheme where the service is preventing us getting stud work up. So what the guys have done, uh, and this is very solid, I checked it myself, they've put a header across, the, the, jam, the jam and stud work on the sides is secured, and rigid, and then above, obviously, it'll get fire batted. But again, it's a, a non-standard situation, which we'd face day in, day out. Um, Joe mentioned goalposts and steelwork. Again, the image on the left is a, uh, a goalpost arrangement where the doors are very heavy. So the contractor in this instance has done the right thing, prepared the steelwork, and then the plasterboard arrangement and stud work goes in and around it. On the right hand side is an apartment scheme where the stuck work going through so the partition has not gone up at full height. So that's an internal wall in an apartment. Again, another internal wall in an apartment. Obviously on the right hand side you can see that the stud work can't go up full height. So uh, again, they've adapted it, created a sill and spanned it back to the next stud work so the opening can be formed and the jam stud be secured, more importantly. So, there's always lots of questions and <coughs> queries that come up. But in, in, in summary on this, the recommendations are that we always consult back to the system provider to make sure that the solution that's being looked at in collaboration for the plasterboard suppliers and the door, su door suppliers is correct. Um, where do we do this? Again, this has been brought up before. Is it stage three or is it stage four? Typically it's stage four. However, again, I was on site this week in Manchester and the guys have built some walls and they don't know what the size of the doors are. Sorry, the weight of the doors. And they've also put the MF ceiling through first. <laughs> so, you know, that's the sort of conundrum we face day in, day out. But getting the design right is most important. And the early we do this, it again is so important to us to make sure that we're not faced with trying to deal with remedial details on site day in day out. So that's it on behalf of Canalf. Thank you very much. Thank you Ian, that is very helpful. Um, just had a couple of quick questions for you. Um, the, the slide that you have where you had the timber in the jam, yep. um, I'm assuming you wouldn't have necessarily fire tested that because you don't test fire door openings. So then that you would then defer to the door manufacturer's evidence, am I correct? So for a project scenario, you've got a door to fix and it needs to be fixed to a timber. We need to then defer to the door manufacturer's evidence to see if they've tested with a timber and the jam. Yes, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the case. I mean the, 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 the purpose of the timber that we've shown in the details there, predominantly the timber's there only to act as a fixing point for the door frame. It's not there for any structural stability under creating the opening in itself. So if there is evidence there, then yes. We don't foresee any issues 
with that timber being there, if it was in the fire test anyway, purely on the arrangement of our experience of the stud and, 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 and a piece of timber. So, I mean, timber in itself performs quite well in a, if, if you were to compare a metal system, and I'm not, uh, well, against a timber frame system, a timber frame system can, is more stiffer in, in terms of um, under a fire, fire test. So, so we're, we're quite comfortable in, in terms of how it would perform. Yeah, okay, good. Good, thank you very much. Um, Jeff and Tom. When you spoke about non standards and the example of um, standing of the door, so you can't take the cuts off and across, because you often look at that and you're confident that is a capacity. But if some third party were to take us, how do you validate that? Not by the biggest standards of how can our label. Oh no, we, we, we do, we do, we do, we do testing of, I mean, you saw the details that Ian showed earlier, those bespoke details. We have expertise in terms of engineering of how well the stud stiffness and the channels perform in terms of its strength and stability. But we also have tested, well, built some of these ad hocly within our test, um, well, training centre. But we know every job is, is different. So it's what we do advise that when it starts to become bespoke and we're getting to a little bit unknown, we always do re recommend working with the, the, the TIGs contractors out there to perhaps build a mock-up and test the frame before completion um, so it's actually signed off. So that's what we tend to do. So we do advise... The, the yeah, yeah. No, because there is no test standard for it. Yeah. yeah. It's doing the best in can, Exactly. Like, exactly. It's where you have to take the take into account what the fire test for, get some performance of that, and then look at BS5234. And it's tested in the very, very worst case scenario of a standard single 70 mil stud and one board. So often on the schemes where these sort of walls are being built, they will be a 90 mil stud or, and, and two layers of board. So, you know, the whole of the system is much stiffer. And we've made provision by increasing the jams and the sills and the headers and using flat fixing plates to make sure that everything's more rigid than it, than it would be normally. But as a test, it's probably difficult. You're taking, you're on the test, you're buying yeah. knowledge. So. Yeah, exactly yeah. that. It's just based upon experience and then obviously working with the contractors on site to perhaps build a mock up just to ensure that all parties are happy. Great question, by the way, and that's exactly the, the collaboration we're yeah. talking about, isn't it? Um, on the products we're doing tomorrow, so that's good. Thank you very much. Okay. Would you start with a round of applause for all of the speakers so far? Um, fantastic. <laughs> very serious. Making me very nervous. If I not use the cards, yeah. and we just deafen everyone as well. I'd not go. No. Why is fire testing? And so, don't test them. How do we quantify and how do we know that the passive system is going to do exactly what the system, different components? So, we talked a lot about testing. Have a look at sort of what sort of temperatures uh, we expose the car. So, this was, to give you an idea, this is the furnace being run up right to its very top, about the door front of it, give you an idea of really those two key figures is that follow a standard time temperature curve. So we start right at zero at the bottom and then we get very, very hot very quickly and then we plateau out over the two hours. And it's the ISO 83. So six minutes, we'll be up somewhere about 660 degrees, just under the half an hour mark, over 850 degrees. When we get to hour, 
under a thousand degrees hot. Then when we get to two hours, carry on to about four hours twenty, it gets to eleven fifty four. Don't ask me how we know that. Give you an idea of what happens to the materials then. So wood typically combusts, timber combusts around 200 to 260 degrees, aluminium melts at 660 degrees, steel melts Another reason why we find not a lot of room for interpretation tells us exactly how to test. More importantly, it tells us what we can do with that information afterwards. DIAP and the XAP, which are direct field of extended form our test certain criteria extend our uh, extend it. Allows us some variation, allows us to do so, types. This one here, I always a low density. Then we test more in. And standard gives us a lot of rules that we can play with. So you'll see on the left hand side we've got different group, we've got different uh, durations, and then we've got different groups, and then there's a different number of layer for each side, and then on the end we've got different standard generally says if we test in group A we can have B and C, if we test in B we can have C, and if we C we only get C. Really push test in a full range. Other rules standard that we can play with. Uh, to people this morning, and Joe quite uh, rightly pointed out the different distances, information opening. It's exactly the same. have a, a minimum construction of 200 millimeters, where operating more than one, got 300 mil between. Now we can reduce this distance if we rigid construction 100 mil. Andy pointed this out earlier, and it's what aimed around the deflection, rigid walls, high density, low density, 
not expecting them to move, whereas where we test with textbook, see up the size, some white blanket, uh, the two, the vertical edges construction are not fixed in the way, and this helps us to simulate a much larger wall. How often are we going to put two doors next to each other in a three metre wall? Not as often as you think. So I've put this up here um, because what we really should be doing try and test as as close as possible life. Slide. It's not yet. It's slightly different. Trying to replicate as far as we can. And production. And we all live in the real world. We are going to have understand, recognize, trying to test exactly in the way that we. See here, next one. This is a normal solid. See up here, we've applied a 25 mil gap gate, junction, and the wall. Bozeman fire? I definitely, I was stood in front of it. See how it is important to try and test, to test everything or test as much as you will. Some uninsulated doors. Section around the wall. about block work walls. It's the same with doors. Are going to Of much data in touched on the diet and the X app and why we've tried. our class. It's really I mean category A allows us to allows us to and provided that we hit the classification time we want, reduce the door and we can Reduce the ironmongery positions of it um, relative to the door as well. So I mentioned the other one is the category B, and for this, it's shown that we've done some overrun. We've we've shown we've given exposed the specimen to a bit more than the classifiable period that we want. So we're showing it's got a robust level of fire resistance. So if we're aiming for a 60-minute door, we really want to hit what the overrunning is, which is a 68 minutes. And what this allows us to do is then extend our product. So if we just do this to the test standard, we can extend our product by 15% in either direction. Um, in some of the other standards that we use, which is why we tested the European one, the other XAP standards, depending on what kind of re uh, effective rebate depth we get and different kinds of deflection, whether it's low, medium, or high distortion, it allows us to have this extendability. You know, we can, if we have a low distortion rate, we can get up to about 25% in either direction. So, what is it that we we're absolutely aiming for in terms of a product manufacturer? Are we aiming for category A? Are we aiming for category B? Well, really, 
we're aiming for category B all of the time because not only is it going to give us the confidence that we're exposing our specimens to a robust level of fire resistance, it's also letting us to extend them practically and do more with it that way. So I'm just going to pass you over to Jeff now. He's going to talk about. Yep, yeah, I'm not sure now which microphone I'm using. Really, about what we what we can do. How do we do it better? Um, obviously, come out the Hackett reports at recommendation A. Um, basically, what is building theme park? Why potentially we have another ground? Hopefully, nobody in this room sit down one morning, switch the telly on, see there's another grown phone and think, I could have done more. My products caused a problem there, or how my products were being used or misused caused a problem there, more that I could have done. That's really the point of this whole seminar, and get that conversation going, get people to collaborate, and get people to because your product on its own might have been fine. The person who installed it may have installed it correctly for how the product on its own right was installed. Yes. Didn't suit the wall system. Variations and changes. The idea is we will never eradicate that entirely. We, more we can do. What, what can we do more? Um, so it is looking at these, looking at the firewall system, looking at the source system, penetrations, and how they all interact, how the building works. At the end of the day, if the door fails, the building the wall fails. Building fails faster. Recommendation B. Again, this comes back to it. A lot of people put products on the market. A lot of people put products together and systems together. But they're not given the information of also what it doesn't do. It needs to be clear. It needs to be transparent. Everybody in the room has to have confidence. When you're, you're doing these things, building these buildings, everything's going to work how you expect it to. If not sure, have the confidence to go to the manufacturers. Manufacturers about your business, what your business is being designed, getting that right, getting that detail right at the early stages, everybody collaborating together and making sure they work together. Recommendation C, scope of testing and application of wireless systems. This comes back to what we said. If you're stood there, you know, there's been serious injury, loss of life, did you do everything reasonably and practically done or that your products and your products in the built environment did what was expected of it. A lot of times I think we can probably all stand there and say done. Certainly stand in there and say well, we could have done more testing and on a lot of opinions. Everybody else said it was okay but we saved a load of money on testing. Say 50. Not really going to We get into field of application reports. We see a lot of these. We see, you know, as Joe said earlier, there's a thing of, you know, you get a piece of paper that says that's certified. That's a fire door. That's a certified door. It. What information is in that certification? You always be asking for is the field of application report. The field of application report. They can always be better, but they need to be clear and concise. But you read the field of application report, and you should be able to see exactly what is in that report matches what you have. It also goes further and tells you what you can and can't do. And again, it's all back to justify by sets of rules from the European standard, if it's a European standard report, because a lot of the, the sort of reports you'll see under the BS are all based around opinion rather than actual fixed rules. By the end, standards can be better. So they give you a lot of rules. A lot of assumptions to look some of those rules right. That is based back to standards. Back to basing it. Where it sometimes goes wrong is obviously you get the site, real world, an awful lot there that you find will actually can't quite meet all the requirements in the field of application. Quite different. 
service some. Then we get into things of project specific assessment. Really, project specific assessment. The building's been designed properly, the was up front, elaborated early, shouldn't need a project specific assessment. Therefore, it's been included in the field of application. But, again, real world, we know go to the notice bodies, the experts. Again, project specific assessment not be done and won't be done by a notified body without actual direct testing base it on. They will collect they'll look at the whole wall systems with evidence is available, make sure that they're basing their opinion on rules from the X apps, which we discussed earlier, and that's where they all start, even with the S ones. Everybody refer back to the X app first. Base it and back from evidence. About engineering assessments, it's often called desktop studies. It's where a fire engineer has sat down, decided from his knowledge and experience, thinks will have no basic. They should never happen. There is no excuse for going and getting one in money. Or talking to us, it might be that we don't have quite, you know, as a door manufacturer, we don't quite have enough to carry out project assessments. I'll happily call Mandate and say, what evidence have you got? What door testing, you know, door apertures have you tested? What within the walls, what inspections for your evidence? Inspections are these of our doors, but deviating slightly from what we've both got to cover from. We're having a project specific. These conversations will happen and main manufacturers in this country are happy. We all want to change things. So through the trade industry bodies, through the meetings we have in, in set groups, in, everybody is actually making sure they make this available that we collaborate. Be asked. Come to us. How do we get it right? Collaboration. This whole seminar has been about. We have the expertise. Said manufacturers. We're the ones out there, we're the test data, we understand our products, we quite often understand how our products work in other people's products as part of that system. We've all got contacts with the industry, we're all very well connected through social media, through industrial through the groups. We're quite happy to talk to each other, we're quite happy to talk with you. Let's get in early, let's get in early with the earlier the better that we start thinking about these building it, that building will and it will Not because any the product doesn't right, but doesn't perform. When should we talk about it? I mentioned earlier, um, technical design, even developed design stage. Actually, no, why not earlier? Why not come back to concept design stage? That's the first point, start making those connections, get to know people, talk to them, say this is what we're planning on doing. Help. We'll come back to you maybe at the develop design stage for a lot more detail. This is a starting. Let, let's get talking about this earlier. We showed earlier this. This isn't something that's just, oh, well, let's everybody know. This must happen. This gateway to going to happen where it's going to start. Hey, talk to us. Let's get it right. Not that hard, and we're all here to talk, collaborate, have the information, have the experts. Okay. Okay. 
Ah, no more.
Yeah, hey, hey, yeah, you too, one, two.
That's where it is. Yeah. 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 China will act there. Top shot. I mean, you. What's happening?
Okay. Hey, yeah, let's go for yes. it, Mike. There was a very good conversation going on here. Perfect, exactly what we want to create. Um, please come forward with any questions as you've got. No, nothing to stop the question. Um, Lewis um, has got a roaming mic that side. Nathan's got a roaming mic this side. Just put your hand up and we'll, we'll get back. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover as many questions as we can. Finally, finish. Sorry? Can I start? You're most welcome. <laughs> so first of all, it's quite loud. It's quite loud. It's quite loud. It's quite loud. My question is always the same. We need to raise our quiet early. And we have to be off at once. Okay. Yeah. 
That's a great question. Um, so, great, relevant question. Um, so, if you come from that. Really, I mean, this comes back <coughs> again what we said earlier that if collaboration is done early, you should be having those problems. We should have picked all of that out early. But it, I suppose, again, <coughs> making sure that everybody's aware of the approachability aspect and, and those sort of discussions and conversations as you're getting involved in the jobs. If you know who are doing the door systems, who are doing the wall systems, <coughs> sort of involving yourself in that conversation that hopefully everything's, you know, if we can get to a stage where everything's sorted out early and it's all correctly designed, and as Joe has said, you know, we're building the design. The design's been done and we're building that and everything's been sorted. But if it's not, yes, yeah, still, you know, approach us. We're, and also, as we said before, we're happy to collaborate. You know, I might find that, well, actually, there is a deviation on site that, that hasn't been allowed for in the design. Um, and we might be lacking evidence in it or we might have concerns about the wall build-up. If we know sort of... For example, Canal for on the job they're doing, you know, it's their wall system that's being used. We'll have that conversation, we'll include you in that conversation. Um, the architect probably needs to be in uh, uh, Quite a lot of those meetings do happen now, to be fair. It does happen now, it just needs to happen more. <coughs> and people in the room, you know, in, a, in the built environment, they need to have the confidence that they can do that. If you're not sure of something, it doesn't just, well, we just try and ignore it because we're not sure, we don't know how. Raise it, try, try and push for it. If we're all doing our jobs properly, then everything should be available. Joe? Joe, you got any comment? I restrict music. I know. I think, the, um, I think this is a pra historical practice. <clears throat> you know, if you talk to anybody in construction, they talk about biblical trades. Carpentry is a biblical trade. Um, plastering is a biblical trade. That's how far back things go. And that the practice that we have now of very much of this build and design is, is something that, that we've grown up with probably over the last 30 years. You know, it used to be the case there was an architect involved, the design would be done, the proper specification would be written, go out to tender, then sort it out and start on site. We've, we've always tried to squeeze value out, out of projects. Value engineering is a term that when I started, never existed um, and it, it is sort of racing to the bottom as quickly as we can. The results of doing that we've, we've, we've all seen. I put that slide up from um, Andy Webster about you know people won't change until the risk of change of, of staying the same is greater than the risk of change. We're at that tipping point now. Things, things have to change. I think seminars like this work like this where we've got a whole group of people in the room from you know, contractors, developers, uh, the, the, uh, the architects, designers, manufacturers, who are listening to all of this conversation. And the more that we get conversations about this area, the, uh, the better it will be for, for industry. So how do, you, how do you deal with it now, in, in the here and now? I think you've got to go back. I think you have to ask, uh, the key question to me is, who's the designer? Who's responsible? Start to make people accountable is probably the key question to get that changed as early as you can in the design. So, can, can, I, can I ask a question back? You may. Do you, in, in terms of um, the Building Safety Act and Gateway 2, is it that, that transition between there, do you think that that's going to make the change that we need? Truth or unknown, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 programs are bought on time and if we're now going to add the next set which is great I think that we can find the money uh, you, you're not the only one that doesn't know we're, we're all still learning about it so there there will be some change and it is about preparation at the end you, know, you talked about Geary and that, that time it takes to solve the problems at the, the, the end all we're doing is we're taking that time and money and just sticking it at the front end 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. I'm really interested to hear from any architects of where we've mentioned them a lot. Please don't be shy. Poor architects. Thanks for picking me up. <laughs> okay. Would you, do we got any comment on um, what we're saying about having all that information ready before construction? Um, possibilities of it. If not, what needs to happen? Things like that. I'm just really interested to hear from you. But a lot of onus being on you. Yeah, it's a very good point, and um, for any of you who may have um, points on this, it comes back to that collaboration with you, um, together with you as well, so we can try and pass all that information and help. Um, CCPI and PSI identify, and, and really back to the hacking recognition, and then you can't do it. That's something that's changing. Looking to change everybody, whether it's who's the architect, like as a contractor or other people as a business, so that everybody has the hand information, ask and feel confident. I understand that it is quite daunting to have to make these decisions, but it's going to get better when you're doing that. Again, I think the other thing that bear in mind is. People, and this is throughout the room, they know that's not, that can't be done like that. I don't know, what other efforts, combinations, but core, stick to the fact that what we know works. Because quite often that's the way. And again, that comes back to that thing of um, building to refer to as general safety and use and, and misuse of product and understanding what misuse of the product is and what it can and can't do. Um, from the point of view of, don't be afraid to say what, what your products can't do. Don't be afraid to say what systems it won't work with. There are routes around that maybe you know a big project that might involve a whole load of testing, a whole load of work between people. One has to be allowed for that. Go and test these things and see what does work and doesn't work. If it works fine. Got some direct evidence for it. Um, but if it doesn't work, then you have to accept the fact that sometimes there are things that you shouldn't do with a firewall. There are things that you shouldn't do with a wall system. And accept the fact that actually maybe the design needs to change a little bit. But you can't do that if you're not given the information right downstream from the manufacturers of actually, no, these products can't do that. You might think, well, it seems quite logical that they can. But actually, there's even test evidence they can't, or there are other reasons they can't, or it might be that you've seen it on a project before where a door system worked in a particular way with the wall system that's being used with. You weren't given the information that actually that's not generic, you can't just chuck that in any other way. There's specific requirements in there that need to be met. And so, again, it's people you know, chasing this sale and stuff and not being afraid to say, actually, hang on, we need to take a step back and make sure. But we can back this with some evidence. You know, we do have that confidence and assurity that what's being done deviates from what's standard, if that's the way you want to go with it, can be backed by evidence and confidence that that product will fall. And ultimately, in really coming back to the, the basis of building control isn't, uh, um, building regulations isn't to prescriptively tell you what you can and can't do, only what the performance requirements are. How you meet them is up to you, but you do need to be, and this is again when the Builder Safety Bill comes in, the hack of the is, it's no good just saying, well, that's what the requirement is, and that's what we're going to say this product does. 
There's got to be a clear link between the two to show confidence and evidence. <coughs> when you're saying it does this, it does it, and it does it in the scenarios it's being used in. And if you don't have that connect, there's a big gap in the middle of everyone saying, well, we think it would be all right. That's not good enough. So, I'm um, sorry, I'm picking on you, I know. But um, I'm interested, in Jeff's presentation, he mentioned that we start considering door, fire doors and walls in stage two. What's your opinion on that? No, I mean, from, from, from our perspective as a, a drywall system provider, what we've started to do in, in the last few years, and in particular quite a lot of industry guidance documents have now been produced, we need to provide checklists based upon experiences. So, for example, when we offer a system solution, a 60-minute, a 90-minute wall, we give typical arrangement details for doors in particular and various sizes. But what we, what we are now encouraging to do is, actually, these are your openings, but please speak to the procured door manufacturer to understand what evidence is available to support those. So we, we, that's what we try to do at our stage. I appreciate there's a... a duration period between design of a, a drywall system and, 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 a, and a door itself. Being, um, so this is what we're trying to do, encourage at our stage, go and speak to the fire stopping manufacturer, go and speak to the door manufacturers. These are the reasons why, because we're learning through the challenges that we're facing on real sites, what to look out for. So that's what we're trying to do, and I think that's, that's the important thing. There's a lot of great work by Joe and uh, the FIS along with the other associations where, especially the fire stopping guidance, having that at early stage and, and learning from it will help us move forward, understanding what types of questions need to be answered. So. That's good. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Mark, go for it. Yeah, question. I appreciate um, the awful job, Harry. Today, and we're, we're as business, we're all putting people in place, especially in place just for sort of fire and situation. Yeah. The clear thing that I see is a, a lack of, not a lack of investment, maybe resources within the people that are actually doing the testing and the stat evidence, like your warrant fires, your IFC. And there's forever a backlog on that where they say the test may be 12 weeks, but then it could be four months down the line. And then all this thing has a knock-on effect with your design intent and stuff like that. So with this new legislation coming in, are they buying into that to put the relevant resources in to maybe have a set period when we can plan that test? There will be have to be you know, project-specific tests throughout the industry. Like I said, it's a real world. We will have to test certain configurations. It's just that time yeah, is very, very flowing. It's not... So if I can pick up on that, there is, and it, there is a problem as well, there are more test labs opening, opportunity there. Uh, most of the test labs are very behind on reports as well, so you might have a test, you've got the test results, and you'll know what the test result was, um, but we don't actually have a report. And, and some, you know, in some cases it's up to a year before people get a test report following it, and the other labs are hard to do that, but obviously they've got to train people up, and there's only... There's only a certain number of people who actually have the aptitude for it before you get into the, the, actually the training that they need in order to be able to do it, and then again another level on from, from writing the test reports. Um, and that's a real problem in the UK. And post Grenfell, obviously, testing has gone up massively, and everybody is trying to test and provide all of this, this backup evidence so we get away from a lot of this opinion and there's actually some evidence behind it. And that itself has swamped all of the current tests. And I absolutely say they are more open. But again, they're struggling actually to get everything into place and be up and running properly. And that, as you say, causes delays. But again, this comes back to, as I said, if we start to think about stuff earlier, you know, you may well be into a project that's being done in two years' time. But we may be able to schedule in some testing sort of two years ahead of that project because we had the early conversations, point out the problems are, and if it's really it's a must have, you must have that be designed, how you need compartmentation within the building. 
actually, if that conversation is started early, you're not afraid to start that conversation early. It might be, we go, yeah, we, it might have been as manufacturers, we go, well, we've seen this quite a lot. So forget just a, your specific project, that this seems to be repeated through quite a lot of building designs at the moment. We know we're coming up. It might be happening for two years or four years. We know that's coming up. We'll go test and get enough test evidence there to support that being added to a field of application. So then you don't have that delay later. But when we suddenly all of the, all of those projects, so there's five projects, all cross country, but all very similar detail to do that, and we find out about it six months before you need those doors, you're not getting that test evidence. Best will in the world. I mean, we we've booked up massive amounts of tests. We we apart from two tests a month, sometimes more. We've got tests booked up well into next year, so we can we can mess around with our schedule and drop tests in, in places that other people will phone up test and say, we have tests, well, it's fine, you can have tests in um, early state, we've got a few six months. So a lot of people are in that position, they don't have the test dates there, they haven't already put a commitment into place for it, so they can't, so then they, you, you need to engage with them early as well, because they need more time. Um, so again, mention what you're doing, try and, try and, this is the concept, this is what we're doing, these early stages, let's, let's get, everybody knows the people involved, the people they're likely to be using, Get that spec done. As Joe said, stop this race to the bottom. If you've got all of these people tied in, you've got this design plan, build that design. Don't change it and then effectively build and design as you go. Fix to it because then you can have all of that stuff in place. So that testing and evidence can all be there long before you put a spade in the ground. I went on that. Well, this Yes. Go on in. Go on, yeah, sorry. Thanks. Um, it's just more of a sort of observation. And projects are driven by cost and program. Clearly, um, <coughs> of architect stage, they probably don't even know what product or what suppliers are going to be. The spec is and or similar. It's all them cost. Now, us as contractors, that's how we read jobs. So, and there's a myriad of, of door suppliers out there, not so many lining systems. So we're, we're always trying to optimise and uh, to get an edge to these jobs. And we've all got similar but different test data and certifications. So it's a little bit unfair to expect architects at stage two, stage four, to be able to have all that information and piece it all together as part of the sort make it work. We, by our very nature, we try and break specs. That's how we survive. Now, clients, they want the most efficient product for their money. So they, they're quite happy to leave specs vague and open. Um, so, you know, maybe I am different. Not so as a, as a factor. Uh, but yeah, so unless, unless you change that mentality, that was all the way back to the client, you're always going to be fighting a big odd action trying to put this all puzzle together at a stage. Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. I'm looking forward to the answer. <laughs> um, just from a, my perspective, I think. Um, Various things have been mentioned about um, the collaboration early on, and um, if we can, the issue um, with breaking spec and changing, obviously, I'm a salesperson, I don't want you to, but yeah. that's by the by when it comes to you. But we um, want to win the job. No, exactly. <laughs> but, and, but I think what we're trying to get across is that um, really important if details have been sorted early on in the job, it may well be between collaboration, say between us and Canal, and there's been our evidence and their evidence for a specific detail, that's when when specifications are broken, that's when the challenges massively come in. Oh, and we've had this exact oh, yeah. thing. I, I, was just, I was just sat here thinking about, everyone's talking about the early stages. I think there's another stage that's missing in the projects, right. and, and I think there's uh, a lot of room for lessons learned on a project. I mean, I've been in there's so much experience on the, on, the, on the stage here, and I've been working for Canal for 24 years, and I've never actually been asked to go back to a project to review 
what we contributed and how we contributed it. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. So, you know, if, if the collaboration that everyone's got on going on here, if you take the architect, the, the, the principal designer, the manufacturers, and everyone is serious about it, what can we do better? How do we learn lessons here? Because they're so big, yeah, you're trying to compete against them. You are more helpful than them. And you mentioned here before that you need to engage. But give yourselves early doors. What if a competitor is not interested in asking questions and they really want the job? It's an interesting one because it's also a way of, so if you're trying to get information out of certain large competitors. And, and, they're, and they're seeing you as a small thing. But if you start to collaborate, if everybody is at them, then they have to collaborate. You get to a point where you have a weight where people have to collaborate. There's too many people involved. They can't afford not to collaborate. And, and you start to do that. And we all have different contacts. And, and we all through this industry, the longer you're in it, the more contacts you make. You might be trying to get an answer out of them. I might better make one phone call and get that answer. If we're all collaborating and we're trying to sort this out, and I'll go, well, it's all right, let me, let me find my contacts. And we, and we work together, and this is kind of the point of it, is trying to get everybody to work together, get everybody to work together at the stage, and come back to your, your thing on, on the breaking specs. Again, this is part of it. You're not just buying the two system products, you're actually buying into that collaboration. The companies, five and the fittest, the companies that work and collaborate best together, are the ones that will continue in the marketplace. Because we're the ones that are improving things if you want to work with us. And this thing of this fear of change. We, we won't change, as Joe said, we won't change until the risk of, of staying as we are it becomes too great. Well, we are at that. We need to change. We need to stop breaking specs because we need to stick to the design. We need to get the design right in the first place. We need to stick to it. So it's not the same or similar. Unless that product can be, that you're about to change in can be proven to be the same spec, the same, same in it. That spec should not be broken. You should. Because all of the work was done up front, not later on, or guessed at. It's all done up front, so you've proven this is what needs to be done. If you want to swap something out and effectively break that spec, what you're swapping in must be of equal or better performance than what was in it. Not this race to the bottom. Not this race to the bottom. Ultimately, the race to the bottom is the main reason that several people died for it. Never be value engineered it, race to the bottom. I guarantee people stood there, salesmen stood there and said, now our technical department will ask themselves, the limitation of our product, you can't use it there. We lost that project for that cladding. Well, great. Body language, but forward and hands -free. Yes, I'm sure Jay, I'm sure Jay wants to jump in. Just on the question about different uh, manufacturers, in the last few years, obviously, now for British Chips and Cineat, along with Chip Rock Island, we work collab collaboratively together under an association called GPDA. And as an association, I sit on the scientific technical committee, and the purpose of the group is all about the issues that we're talking about today. How do we work from a technical point of view ensure relevant guidances are produced to support the, the supply chain. So that's what's happening. I think what you'll notice, there is been a step change. Now, I've seen it in the last <coughs> three or four years, where lots more guidances are coming out from industry associations rather than specific manufacturers to help drive commonality across the industry. No, I haven't seen it yet. Yeah, so, right. yeah, so yeah, yeah, just, just to... Roger. I love, I love this because the comments that you come really sort of get you thinking. So we all look at the problem depending on where we are. All right, so I, was a, I, I used to sell products, specify it, and I hated it when somebody tried to break my spec. But if I got an opportunity I could break somebody else's spec, I'd go in there and try and break. That's, that's the nature of what we do. So you sell based on what you can do. And so the, the, the model is price delivery, isn't it? You know, it, it, it's all of that. But we also know that, that there are problems associated with that. That's why we're all here today. So the, the, the problems with, with doing those things, making those late changes, you know, like, like the school, that was a, a tragic thing. 
uh, w without making those, those changes early enough, we, we, we get the problem. I think this is an opportunity for us to step back and look at what we're doing and how can we do it better? How can we do this differently so that we do save time and money? You know, 14% of waste in, just in plasterboard itself is a huge amount. Anybody connected with dry lining and you talk about 14% saving is huge. It, it's absolutely huge. So uh, the, the data shows that there is another way of doing it and we can get it better. If, if, if we do it right, sort of right, right from the beginning. Um, but I think we do need to understand how the model is at the moment, how we have the Tier 1 contractors working in the way that the Tier 1s are contractors. Generally, it's driven by the demand from the clients that say, I want it cheaper, I want it faster. But actually, we stand back from that. So the, the results of cheaper and faster are not cheaper and faster because, because of all of these. So we do have to stand back from it. You know, we come back again and again early. The, the earlier we can engage, the earlier we can get involved with looking at that design and, and, and putting it in. And e equal or approved is a thing that, uh, it's, it's like soundproof and fireproof to me. No such thing, you know, similar or approved is what yeah. you hear. Equal, it has to, it's in the standards, it has to be equal and it should be approved by the person responsible for doing the design. And that's the bit that we've forgotten and we've, we've got this similar or approved. We, we, we've made a bed of our own making, and it's, it's, it's time, I think, now to change, but to change to the benefit of everybody. So we shouldn't do this so that the specialist contractors can't, can't bid. We shouldn't do this so that the manufacturers you know, lock it, a project in or, or lock a project out and there isn't competitiveness. And we shouldn't do this so that the people that are able to provide us some of the fantastic buildings that have gone up over the last 15 years uh, with the speed and the, the design and the just just you know just have a look at the shard look at how they decided to build that going up and going down at the same time that's innovation so we do need that innovation to happen but i think it is that time to 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 stop take a check and see how we can make this work for everybody uh, yeah just a quick one um,
trying to right, we'll actually try and design a bit more. Come talk again. We'll start to work together to design a building. That's what. Sorry, wait, it's five past one. I'm sorry if we keep. What is it? Got Chris and then Matt and then. I mean, the 200, 300 mil European standards, and the European standard was first introduced in 2001. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it is not a rule that everybody is um, familiar with, and it's because we run a two standard system in the UK. So we have two options to compliance. And rightly or wrongly, and this is my own personal opinion, is that one of them is much harder to do than the other. So if you're a product manufacturer, and you know, we're, we're talking about this race to the bottom of the time, we've got to invest an enormous amount of money into testing. What route are you going to take? Do you want to get your product out to market as quickly as possibly as you can so you can reclaim that? Or do you want to spend your time really designing your product to do everything and anything that it could possibly do? And like I said about the CCPI and the hacking recommendations, it does, you know, we can take some blame in it. We need to start making these rules clearer for you and clearer for all of the users of what it is specifically for our products and that we can and we can't do. And it, as you quite rightly said, it is specific to fire doors and it doesn't matter if it's a steel, timber, steel and timber, it is specific. The test standard is specific to all of them. That is the the minimum requirement of the standard and then when the work really comes is after that and it's the collaboration with the wall system manufacturers because they'll have slightly different um, targets than we will in terms of its performance and it's it's to move on to start reducing this the, the standards are written by panels of committees that are through across lots of different member states who all have a different way to the built environment i mean let's look at italy so for italy you need to have you need to have a test schedule. You then need to go and have uh, an expert opinion written by the laboratory. That then has to go to the government, and the government will say yes, no. You can sell your product to the market. You don't have that here. We could go and do a test. I could go tomorrow, test a door, and start selling it straight to the market. So, and it is and it is it is a two way street. So we both we both not do, you know us as the product manufacturers, but as the contractors as well, is getting that information out there. And this is really where BIM is supposed to, mm. both, supposed to help and solve a lot of this, is we put an element in here and it says yes or no. This is, again, sort of, where, sort of interesting point for people that maybe don't realise. If a European standard is written, fits with a national standard, that national standard will within 12 months. So BS476 was written, last amendment, 1987. BSEN 64 came out in 2000. It's been amended several times. The latest amendments 2014. 
18 minutes, yet people are still going out to the product 1987 standard. What's changed since 1987? Quite a lot. Yes. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> A little less fireproof, maybe. Um, but, but this is the point. It, a lot of these things, you know, we are running, as, as Tom just said, we're running to two standards. Why? Why are we running to two standards? Why have we allowed that to happen? It was originally given a stay of execution for about five years, BS476 before it's moved on. But nobody really, the, the, everybody's tried to get away from testing 1634 because it is harder. It gives you more robust detail, but also it's better. It gives you more robust detail. Gives you a better and clearer set of rules, less reliance on opinion, um, and and this is where we're at. But at the same time, everybody can legitimately work to BS four seven six. It's still in the rules. That's the answer. How's that being represented? Yeah, I mean. We, 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 have, we, we have to take responsibility more, but also at the same time, you see the building regulation is steadily changing as it's trying to put away from the I like you more. That again, hopefully, will lead to a change in really change your understanding, starting really with building control officers. But they have quite a lot of time, very little understanding. Again, like you said with the architects, there is so much to understand. How can you be an expert in it? And seminars like this. <laughs> that's what the sta that's what the minimum distance for us as our product in the standard allows us to do unless we unless we do you know unless we do that specifically but then we're looking at standard doesn't allow us to the standards and and this comes back to the associated thing so I think what people want to see out of seminars like this is, is action. To see something come out. Jim, you don't know about this yet. <laughs> um, we'll produce a guidance note. We'll produce a guidance note with help and with help from GPDA. The reason I'm pointing at Jim is that I'm, I'll, I'll say that we're doing this, but Jim will do the heavy lifting and uh, we'll, we'll get that out as soon as we can. So that's a, that's a confirmed action that we'll do. Yeah, we're, you know, we're taking away an old to add it to our standard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll speak to yeah. I'll speak to our GTA uh, members or some sort along with Joe's out there. Great point, Matt. That then to the on site program. This needs to be re so it clients need to really talk about with working needs to be done that is going to take time now that needs to be done way in advance ground but we've all been on jobs where we break, break ground and you know you're still designing foundations now, so let, let's let's try and manage clients expectations as well yeah, that's a great point and um yeah as a result of this as well it is we're trying to push um, I did call a pass. I was, I was hoping to wrap up that now, but I don't want to um, miss anyone that had a. There will be an email coming out afterwards. So I wanted to ask you directly. Go on,
by it. Um, further on, the NIP sizes testing. So, about where you Perfect question. I, I had that on my last well, myself. So. <laughs> Great question. Um, definitely you can keep it within five minutes. <laughs> I'll park it picked on. <laughs> um, yeah, basically, as Tom just mentioned, there is the, that's not allowed standard wall detail. So you associate again and station on test or where you know, do it. You can't do anything else. But we, we were sort of now we're talking about earlier, but we've um, corner details and abutments and like that, you can't test for that. So what can you do to ensure that? And it does have a big impact, and there's a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of opinions, oh, it'll be fine because your one's rigid, it's flexible, but that's right because door sets, for example, have been tested in rigid, they've been tested in flexible. Now, the interaction between the two has a whole different dynamic, and not necessarily, it might be fine in rigid, it might be fine, but actually, it's something that twist and distort the door away, never been tested to before, whilst it's also fighting all of its requirements during that heat and temperature difference. Uh, timber doors, effectively, if you've ever toasted one side of the piece, that's how they react. So one side shrinks. Generally, this is why, why the door opening inwards is considered generally more arduous and a lot of assessment done for, for the door being sort of less arduous opening outwards. Therefore, it's seen as being less the most arduous. But actually, as soon as you start throwing other things in the walls, how that door worked, door and frame, for example, may change because one side of the frame might be doing one side of the frame is doing something else. Then the frame interaction with the door changes and get a test failure because twists going on. How do you find out? Well, ultimately, you go testing. And there's a vast amount more when we talk to those my bodies is very much going to want all these things testable. Really because we can't jump from one to the other. Yeah. Uh two hundred mil wall nib. Uh what happens in the in the case where you have a kind of raised access floor and a rise door? Build the, the wall down to the slab. That also the 200 mil. That not being part of the tests or how, is that? The, the testing will be, again. Uh, Tom might probably have on this as well. The testing obviously generally in the door test you will test on a threshold. So the threshold extends 200 mil inside. Have no raise. Where we're doing specialist doors. Then you're doing things like the, the riser doors, which are quite well known for. We will have a minimum of 100. Test rate four, then frame detail. Have our frame detail that we have a minimum one. And it's bottom. Is that hundred mil on a standard? No, that's just for us in terms of what is practically what we can practically do to install the door. In terms of the, the standard, because we when we test we have uh, we apply a pressure to the door and we have at a plane, we have it where it has no pressure at all. So it's considered that at the bottom of the door, we're not having any acting on it. We're pulling the air in through the door. And then when we get to this neutral axis, is then when we start to apply positive pressure to the door. So we're putting more emphasis and more strain on the door and wall for higher up it is. So the 200 mil surround, generally, is for the vertical edges and above the door. And this is because it's when we write uh, standards, we're trying to cover, you know, we're trying to write it in a way that doesn't limit innovation, but we're trying to write it in a way that we try and cover everything. So at the first time that the standard was written, you know, we, have, we, we aren't considering four-sided doors. We're only really considering three-sided doors like we have here in the building. It's as, it, as we move on and as we do the specific testing is then when we find out as to what these limits can be and what we can do to either reduce these these constraints and, and how much testing and that's we need to engage with the notified bodies with that. We need to 
engage industry wide with them. We just don't know at this point, but we can move to try and understand. That sort of answer your question. Just, just Harry, Harry, just to add to that, when, when you get that, when you get to the up stand, you get to the up stand and our point of view, building that in dry lining, which is non load bearing, likely someone will be stepping on that at some time, becomes quite a difficult detail to build. Because if you're building it in shaft wall, that's very difficult. You might have to think about it again in a different system to achieve the fire rating of the system to achieve that threshold that's being the upstand. But there's a knock-on effect to it as well, because I've seen people scratching their head time and time again on how to do that detail. Yeah, it's a great point, and um, I think what we can do is, is push out. I think definitely an action from out what comes from the standard. Fixed construction is more of a challenge because versions of yeah. yeah, so no, that's good. Thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate yeah, it. Well. I'm sorry. Go on. Just, just, uh, I'll be, I will be brief. <laughs> what a great day. What a really, really good day. I think, I think we need to thank Harry and Jeff and Tom and the rest of the team for putting this together because it's been absolutely brilliant from my point of view. So, keep round of applause for them. <laughs> the, the other thing I want to leave with is, is just a thought. So we always think about what can we do to make things better. Think about what we can do to make things worse. Less time on site, more broken specifications, less detail on the, on, the, on the drawings, less interaction, less coordination, and we will get a worse job. So surely, if we flip that right over and get more coordination earlier in the project with more time, we'll get a better output. That's a very good answer. Thank you very much. Please yeah, feel free to um, come chat to any of us if you've got any questions. We will send an email out. If there's any topics or anything you'd like to hear about or speakers you'd like to hear from, please put it on I'm going to take your well. card. I'm I'll I'll just get thinking I don't have it, but okay. I'll you now. Yeah, you've got, yeah, you've got my, you've got yeah, my yeah, card. Just, number. Yeah. You're more than welcome to yeah, take that. Good debate. Yeah, just drop me a yeah. yeah. return email and I'll yeah, get, get in contact and get someone.